I'm here in Berlin with Daniel Oils from the University of Warwick. Dan, it's great to see you. Thank you. Um, and why are you in Berlin? Um, I'm here because I have a Humboldt uh, Stiftung Research Fellowship, which means I'm here for about uh, 12, 12 months to 18 months. I'm doing a research project on an 18th century art historian okay. called Johann Joachim Winkelmann. Okay. And Winkelmann is regarded as a founding father for the subject of classics and classical archaeology more generally. Ah, why is that? Well, in 1764, he published a book called uh, Die Geschichte der Kunst des Altertums, which, which means... is in English <laughs> uh, The History of the Art of Antiquity. Oh. And it was basically the first work of classical scholarship that ordered ancient art into a historical chronology. So before then? What, what so before then, about? when people uh, talked about classical art, they intended to publish uh, collections of art, so famous collections of um, Roman princes, princes in Naples, and okay. so on. Um, and these collections weren't organised in, on a historical basis. I so see, just thematically. Uh, thematically. Yeah. So it was more interesting in sort of the 1650s, so Winkelmann was writing in 1760, so yeah. what was more inter interesting before that was trying to identify who was being represented on, by these statues, I by see. these coins, so that's what we call icon iconographic analysis. I see, so the interest okay. is in the kind of the subject matter exactly. and, yeah, and, yeah. and exploring connections. Exactly. Right. And what, but no overall or overarching structure. Exactly, and so what Winkelmann, what was revolutionary about Winkelmann's work was that he ordered or he organised all these fragments, these scattered fragments of antiquity that were recorded in all these antiquarian publications, and he tried to put them into an historical chron chronological order. That's a phenomenal... Which was work. a phenomenal thing to do. Yeah. And he had to read an awful lot in Greek yeah. as well as Latin, a huge number of antiquarian publications, and he set up these categories of archaic Greek art, high classical Greek art, beautiful classical Greek art, Hellenistic Greek art, and then Roman art, and he set up these, these periods, periods the which are still now. used now in classical art and archaeology. And um, where was he coming from? Why, did, why was it Winkelmann who had, had this uh, structure in mind? Well, he was very interested in writing a narrative about the rise and fall of a civilization. And this is something, this kind of arc... This rise and fall pattern yeah. was something that was very common uh, to the Enlightenment imagination. I see. So you might think of the decline and fall of the Roman yeah. Empire, Vedas, yeah. given, for instance. Yeah. So, so it's part of this broader culture. So it's part of a broader European Enlightenment um, intellectual culture he was participating in. Yeah. Interesting. So now, what is your work specifically focused on? Well, I'm. I speak with. Uh, because uh, a few minutes ago, I mentioned that uh, Winkelmann is regarded as the founding father right. of classics. Well, of our subject. Of our subject, yeah. exactly. Um, by writing his first sort of historically, chron chronologically ordered narrative. Yeah. And um, working with these categories that we're still working Exactly, with. absolutely, yeah. And I want to sort of play around and slightly prod that mythology. Okay. And so what I'm interested in, in, in is the fact that Winkelmann's Geschichte, his history, yeah was uh, very quickly, he, th he thought it was redundant as soon as, he, as, soon as, he, as soon as he published it, basically. And that's because he was very aware that constantly new uh, finds were being dug up, especially out of Herculaneum and Pompeii. Which would complicate these which was com neat divisions. Absolutely, which was complicated huh, his analysis. Okay. And now, unfortunately, Winkelmann died at a relatively young age in 1768, uh, but he left enough uh, manuscript notes for... a. Uh, a longer, a longer second edition of his work being published in 1776, right. which was then published. But then the problem became, the problem just continued more as more and more things were being excavated throughout Italy. Yeah. More and more uh, objects needed to be slotted into this history. I see. So and very quickly, his, his history was translated and two editions came out in Italian in the 1780s and the further two editions in French in the 1780s and the 1790s. So you had about five and these translations, I'm arguing, weren't necessarily very accurate. They played around and changed what he was writing. Yeah. Um, they, they, re they reassigned the places of statues that he'd put in certain ages to different certain, in, into different, into other ages. 
and, and um, they're formalising also these divisions. As well. Yeah, but what you get is kind of five, four or five different versions of income circulating yeah. in German, French, and Italian for German reading and French re yeah. reading and Italian audiences. And it was these texts that were read in the early 19th century by massive figures like Hegel and, you know, French luminaries in the early 19th century. Um, and, but you have different versions of income circulating, so there isn't a straightforward founder of our subject. Rather, there are different nationalist stories about how income gets taken up. Okay, can I press you on what some of these okay, national distinctions so look like? to give you one obvious, uh, one, uh, one example that has been researched uh, on uh, quite a bit is Winkelmann's reception in France. So the translations of Winkelmann that came out in the 1780s and 1790s very quickly became part of a revolutionary politics. So to just give so you again, a So again, the cultural context is really important. Yeah, absolutely. So Winkel, one of the things Winkelmann argued was that uh, ancient Greek art, so Winkelmann, uh, most, Winkelmann admired classical 5th century Greek art the most, okay? and he thought that Roman art was a, a poor imitation, a poor copy uh, of that this. narrative of... And that narrative has been played uh, out again and again. The decline you know, the of The decline into, into Roman yeah. uh, extravagance or decadence yeah. or yeah. imitation yeah. from the beautiful Greek original. Yeah. Was a, was a trope or a, or a kind of narrative yeah. that Winkelmann set up and, and then it became very popular in the 19th into the 20th century and it's something we still live with today. Sure. Um, and in France, this, uh, this, this idea was taken up and they started running with it. And so one of the reasons why Winkelmann had argued that Greek art was so good is that he said that the Greeks lived in a perfect moment which allowed Greek art to be produced. Okay. And, from and Greek, by Greek art, so we're really talking about art in 5th century, yes, exactly. Right. You know. um, and he, he said that the Greeks were a free people. Okay. Okay? And he also talked about the marvellous Greek climate, it wasn't too cold, it wasn't yeah. too hot. Yeah. But he talked a lot about the freedom of the Greeks. Right, okay? and this is interesting, the whole idea of uh, freedom at this time. Right, time exactly. Time. When, yeah, when you think about, I mean, already in the 1770s, you've yeah. got the American War of Independence yeah. and so on. Uh, and the second, this posthumous edition of Lincoln's work in Germany, published in 1776, right. exactly okay. the time of American independence. Yeah. Um, now, Winkelmann's idea of freedom was more of a personal, moral, intellectual freedom that the artist was, a, was free to think and free to create and free to kind of follow, tr follow traces and tracks in his mind in order to produce a really beautiful piece of art. But in France, by the 1790s, this Winkelmanian idea of freedom had become fully associated with politics yeah, in its most re uh, revolutionary form. Okay? Yeah. So you had busts of Winkelmann in revolutionary France in the 1790s in, in, in museums all across France. Okay? And by the time Napoleon comes along, Napoleon once he, uh, he sacks Italy as it were, and he drag in a kind of Roman style triumph, just as the way the Romans appropriated Greek masterpieces for their own gardens and villas. Yeah. And Napoleon does exactly the same thing. He, 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 he takes a load of Greek or Greek Greco-Roman uh, masterpieces and he schleps them into Paris. Right. Okay. So uh, this this Winkelmann this Winkelmanian ideas becomes central to revolutionary um, ideas about freedom in France and uh, what is, it, what is it to be a free person to think freely and then right. Napoleon takes it over. I was gonna, so I can certainly see the, the relevance for thinking about the, the French Revolution mm -hmm. uh, and how Winkelmann's ideas play into that. When Napoleon takes it over, I'm kind of interested in how, how that's then spun out differently. Maybe, maybe the same idea of freedom, but right, now, sure. now we're dealing with someone who's looking maybe a little bit like a Roman emperor. No, absolutely. And the... Uh, the collection, so uh, Napoleon was participating in a long tradition of collecting antiquity that was associated with people who were aristocrats and yeah. princes from the Italian Renaissance onwards. Yeah. So uh, I would think you know, Napoleon himself was less interested in uh, the revolutionary ideas about freedom that Winkelmann was writing about 
and he was more interested. He was jumping on a bandwagon. Yeah, cultural cachet. He was jumping on a, a yeah. huge enthusiasm for classical art that yeah. had been created by, partly created by Winkelmann, and that had snowballed in the 1790s. And as a result, he was building on that. And it's legitimating his rule. Exactly, well. legitimating his rule. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. exactly. So. Fantastic. That's uh, one aspect of mm -hmm. your, um, your work, and that's what you're doing yeah, now. Yeah. I wonder if I could ask you about what you've done in the past. Okay, sure. This is bound to interest uh, viewers. Yeah, yeah. Because um, you kind of do sex stuff. Right? Okay, the well, fans, yeah, well, I, I, talk, I, I have worked on the history. I do work on the history <laughs> of sexuality, exactly. So, one of the things I'm interested in as a classical reception studies scholar is the relationship, obviously, between ancient and modern antiquity and modernity. And what I'm particularly interested in is how a sense of uh, a certain sense of history was developed at the end of the 18th century. That's to say, a certain sense of modernity developed by polarizing or trying to historicize our relationship to the ancient world. Okay. Okay. So numerous people have written about numerous historians of Europe and the West and the United States, North America, and so on. Have uh, written about how we how we became modern in all sorts of ways in the 18th century, through the Enlightenment, through yeah. urbanisation, Industrial Revolution, politics, the French Revolution, the American War of Independence. So it's actually, so, I can see some great similarities and mm -hmm. crossover between you know, your work now and what you've been done. Yeah, been no, done. exactly, yeah. And so um, what I'm interested in is how this sense of being modern actually was constantly occurring, but by turning back to the ancient world and thinking about well, the only one, the, one of the ways you think about yourself as a modern person is by thinking how you're not ancient, or maybe how you are ancient, and how how antiquity, how ancient culture is offered an example or a counterexample sure. for who we are. Okay. And you explore this in the realm of sexuality. Yeah, right? exactly. So one of the things I, I was interested in in a book I wrote called Classical Culture and Modern Masculinity was how the the subject or the issue of Greek pederasty mm -hmm. was of great concern and interest to German and British scholars in the 18th and 19th century. And, uh, and it was for a very particular reasons. And the, so the topic of Greek pederasty kept on recurring in this period. Mm. And I discovered that what was interesting about this was that the, uh, German and Greek writers, uh, sorry, German and British writers had a sort of rather polarised response to Greek pederasty. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, they viewed a figure like Socrates and his admiration of younger men and boys and youths in the Platonic Dialogues yeah. as an example of what a teacher should be doing. Okay? Nice. So the close relationship between the Socratic teacher and his pupil yeah. was played out by lots of German and British scholars as an, precisely an ex, as an example for passing on knowledge from one generation to another. So for many scholars, the pederastic relationship was one precisely about the relationship between an older generation, a younger generation, a relationship about the relationship between ancient and modern itself. How do we learn as a younger generation from an older generation? How do traditions, ideas, ideals, virtues get passed on from an older generation to a younger generation? And the pederastic relationship became a motif for expressing uh, and articulating and understanding how we might relate back to the ancient world. So you had lots of Germans. So there was, uh, for example, there was this, uh, there was this German uh, philology professor called Johann Gesner, who was the first professor of philology at Göttingen uh, University, mm -hmm. which is regarded as the first modern university. And what period are we talking about? Uh, 1730s, mm -hmm. okay. And Gesner wrote a very, a very interesting short work, which is regarded as the first analysis, historical analysis of the Greek pederasty, which is called Socrates, the Holy Pederast. Right. Okay. okay. And he argued from a Christian perspective that Socrates was a holy as a pederast because his pederasty was pure and was designed to inculcate values to the next generation. Okay. Now straight away. Uh, this uh, pamphlet was misunderstood, and uh, thinkers like Voltaire 
uh, reported that there's a professor in Germany who's uh, advertising buggery. Okay. <laughs> so, and that's the other side of what you get, right, this yes, response to Greek right. pederasty, is that the Greek pederasty isn't exemplary for modernity. It isn't actually an example of how older men might teach younger men in a university setting or in yeah. schools, yeah. but actually Greek pederasty is completely different from modernity. Yeah. Yeah, we don't do that. We don't do that anymore. We've moved beyond. We have Christianity. Yeah. It's something that should not be named and so on. Yeah. So what I explore in this book is how Greek pederasty vacillates and oscillates between being an example of what it means to teach younger men, or what it means for older men to teach younger men things, and at the same time being an anti-example, an example of what it means to be completely different from modernity, completely ancient, completely other. Right. And so what you get is, with Greek pederasty, is, is a really interesting moment in which se uh, several writers, scholarly and literary, are exploring the relationship between antiquity and modernity. And when they think about Greek pederasty, it becomes a particular problem. Yeah. It, what, does Greek pederasty offer an example of how we should teach, how we should pass on yeah, generations? Because, it, because it's so bound up exactly. with say, education and culture. Right, in absolutely. Values exactly. Values, right? Yeah. So it's our, when we're teaching young men in our universities, yeah. are we being like Socrates? Yeah. Or are we not? Because there are, there are you know, crossovers exactly. and similarities exactly. in, in the close relationships. That in, Oxford, in 19th century Oxford tutorials. Yeah. So yeah. Benjamin Jowett, the Regis Professor of Greek for yeah. half a century in Oxford, yeah. was often called Socrates. And yeah. people, uh, because of that in language. Exactly, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. People associated him, uh, they, they, uh, they called it Socratic worship or Jowett worship. Yeah. Um, so he had lots of young men worshipping uh, Benjamin Jowett as if he was a, a Socratic sort of magician-like figure almost. Right, but only um, one version of it. But a particular yeah. type of version. So the issue of Greek pederasty gets bound up in how are we or how are we unlike right. antiquity. So it's good to think with in terms of Absolutely. our relationship with antiquity. Absolutely, yeah. That's really interesting. Then. And, the, and the, the book again was called? Um, Classical Culture and Modern Masculinity. Okay, I think we'll have a link on the website okay. to that. No and we can look forward to a book on Winkelmann. Uh, yes, hopefully a book on Winkelmann. Definitely. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. It's been no an absolute pleasure and good luck for the rest of your time here. Bro. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you.